for the remainder of today's agenda, we're going to be picking up on that tremendous energy that followed in the question and answer um, after Wayne's uh, presentation. So we're going to be focused on action and next steps and specifically referencing the title of this year's symposium, how we put this plan into action. How do we build off the success of this regional planning process and keep this momentum moving forward. Uh, before lunch, so we heard from Chris and Wayne who highlighted the um, general and specific strategies that it were identified uh, for the Great Marsh region. And as we heard as well, there's also specific strategies that pertain to a variety, quite a lengthy um, array of areas of concern that were identified within each of the six communities engaged in this planning effort. And both the regional and town-specific strategies, again, are all operationally feasible, and so they are considered shovel-ready and can be implemented in the nearer to moderate term. Um, and as we were all kind of sharing, and again, in the Q&A after Wayne's, is there are some challenges, inherent challenges, in how we move from planning to implementation. And so picking up on that conversation, I want to just highlight some considerations, some guidance, and offer some recommendations based on some of the major challenges widely associated with implementing nature-based strategies in particular. Um, again, we, it sounds like we all um, understand what those challenges are, but ultimately increasing awareness and having a shared um, understanding of these challenges is going to be really key to moving this region forward um, and towards a more wider adoption of these types of solutions. And then I will introduce um, our next two speakers who are going to be sharing um, a couple case studies um, where we're going to see how some of our neighboring communities are finding success implementing some of this work uh, to enhance coastal resilience. So the first and potentially um, most important consideration is all in regards to site-specific considerations. Projects that are not designed to function within the biological and physical processes of a specific site have a higher likelihood of failing. And unfortunately, when projects fail, um, it can perpetuate this pu public uncertainty um, for why these solutions need to be adopted. So this is really important, especially in increasing um, building the case for why these uh, solutions are important and cost effective, as well as can achieve so many benefits. So um, although it can be time consuming, it's really important right from the get go to um, take on feasibility and site assessment um, assessments to really fully understand whether or not a design is appropriate and if it is appropriate given the specific processes at that site, how can the design be unique and um, ultimately be the most successful in implementing? Because again, as resources are so limited, the last thing you want to do is put a lot of time and energy into a project that's only going to fail ultimately if because it's not cited properly. And of course, in order for solutions to be sustainable, it's really important to take this holistic approach by um, understanding considering how your project fits in the regional context. So as we take on these individual on the ground projects, how does, this, how does this project interrelate with other projects that are potentially going on in the region? How does it, um, how does it relate to the regional system trans, trans, um, processes and um, regional management as well as other natural resource management activities that are going around? Because everything is connected, right? So Rather than taking on a piecemeal approach with implementing projects here and there, we really need to, again, just take this regional uh, coordinated approach to implementing all of these strategies in our towns. And as we discussed, permitting can, um, is certainly a challenge and can be seen as a barrier um, and a hindrance, um, but it's very important. And because the permitting is ultimately there to ensure that no adverse impacts are happening to these natural resources that are so precious to this community. So it's really, really important to engage um, regula regulators um, in the permitting process early on. So that's as you are have an idea. So as you're looking at through the adaptation plan and you see some of these recommendations for uh, on the ground nature-based strategies is reaching out to uh, these regulators and people who have 
kind of the insight from the permitting perspective on what you can do to help make your design most effective. Again, so you're just ensuring that any time and energy and resources that you're putting in right from the get-go is ultimately going to be help you in the long run and being most successful um, in implementing these projects as well as the projects themselves being successful in the long term. And of course, funding is always a challenge. Um, it's always limited. There never seems to be enough funding. Um, as we kind of highlighted earlier in the earlier presentations, you know, working with partners and engaging as many partners as you can is just a a win-win strategy and it helps pool resources and it also just can help uh, make you, you and your project and your community more competitive in applying for various grants and resources that are out there. Um, there's also a couple considerations for um, in wanting to engage uh, funders early on in the process. So. Uh, people who are familiar with requests for proposals, so various funders will put out regularly or annually these requests for proposals, and after those proposals are put out, you typically can't really engage that funder um, in asking for tips and considerations and, you know, is hey, is this project good? But before those proposals are put out, you can engage the funder and you can get a better idea of what types of projects they may be looking for. So when that request for proposal does come out, you can be really competitive. And the fourth is all about outreach and engagement, which um, Wayne had touched on and saying, you know, highlighting the importance and how perhaps this is the most important piece of all of this. Um, there needs to be public buy-in ultimately for all of these, uh, all of this work and uh, nature-based strategies in general. And <clears throat> nature and nature-based solutions could be implemented more widely if the full scope of benefits and costs were better communicated and understood by contractors, residents, and private loan, uh, private landowners, and decision makers. And who delivers this content is equally as important. Um, in fact, so there's a, a national uh, polling that was recently conducted and TNC um, distilled this all into a report that found that when it comes to communicating concepts of resilience and nature-based solutions, health professionals, emergency management officials, police and firefighters um, are often the most effective and trusted as frontline messengers. So communities within the Great Marsh, in addition to all the tremendous outreach and engagement initiatives that are already happening here, um, should also look to engage these individuals in these sectors in this work and to join implementation efforts and, jo and to join your messaging so we can ultimately just help improve and advance this work going forward. So these um, challenges among excuse me, recommendations, um, among others, are all highlighted in a chapter of the adaptation plan providing additional detail. And throughout, I just want to touch on also throughout the regional strategies, throughout the town specific strategies, and also through these recommendations, throughout the plan there are a number of hyperlinks and resources um, available. So when, if someone is reading it and is looking for more information, those resources are there to pointing you in that direction. So specifically regarding um, limited funding and whatnot, there are some hyperlinks available to uh, funding sources that are like in this area as well as other uh, as well as online portals that host a whole suite of available funding opportunities that pertain to adaptation projects and this concepts of coastal resiliency. As these challenges, you know, they do exist and um, implementation can be difficult. Um, there are a lot of coastal communities around uh, the nation um, in Massachusetts and also some here in the Great Marsh that are finding a lot of success implementing this work. And in fact, there's a couple communities already here today who have already begun to implement and take action on some of the recommendations and strategies that are identified in this plan, which is really tremendous. Um, it hasn't even come out and it's already it's already getting going, but we need to keep it going. Um, and so with that, I want to introduce our next two speakers um, who are going to be highlighting two case studies. Our first speaker is Julie LeBranch. Uh, Julie is a senior planner at the Rockingham, uh, New Hampshire Planning Commission with 16 years of planning experience. She has a particular interest in climate change planning, which she began while employed by the state of Maryland and as a chair of the Chesapeake Bay Program Climate Work Group. She is a native of Seacoast, New Hampshire, and an avid gardener and supporter of the local agricultural and food scene. 
Her work in the region includes assisting communities with development of master plans and policies, zoning ordinances, and regulations related to land use, natural resource protection, climate change, energy, and stormwater management, and also integrating land use and transportation planning uh, concepts. Julie participates as a member of the New Hampshire Sea Grant Policy Advisory Committee, the New Hampshire Adaptation Work Group, and Vice President of, New, of Northern New England Chapter of the American Planning Association. She holds a BS in Geological Sciences from Salem State College and a Master's of Arts and Master's of Science in Earth Science Geology from Montana State University. Julie? Thank you. I'm just going to keep that water close by. I'm struggling with a cold, and uh, I'll try and speak clearly uh, as we go along. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, I remember my first Great uh, Marsh Symposium was um, at Castle Hill about eight years ago, and when the day that Superstorm Sandy rolled on, sh on shore. It was quite a, quite a stormy and uh, crazy uh, time and, and day, but uh, what an apropos event to happen on a cli at, a, at, a, at a climate summit. <laughs> So I, again, I'm, I work in coastal seacoast New Hampshire uh, for the Rockingham Planning Commission, which has 27 municipalities in its planning region from Portsmouth all the way down the coast and then west along the Massachusetts border. Um, one thing I want to start off with is a little bit of um, terminology translation because New Hampshire is different than Massachusetts. So a master plan is, is, is equals a comprehensive plan here. Uh, a zoning ordinance is a zoning bylaw by here. And also, our form of governance is slightly different in that we have uh, our legislature enables communities to take actions, and those communities must meet the minimum standards of the state laws. However, they are enabled to go b above and beyond those standards. Uh, they're, not, they're not tied into uh, a maximum standard of any, of any kind. So although the communities have been given wide breadth and uh, latitude to, to take action, our communities have really just started to work on climate adaptation in the last few years, and I want to talk a little bit about that. First, I want to just talk to you a little bit about our coastal adaptation work group in New Hampshire and how we formed and what we do, what we work on, uh, what, our fu what our function, our, emi our mission is. <coughs> Excuse me. And then I wanted to highlight two um, capstone projects that we worked on, um, Tides to Storms, part one and two, and our sea rise, coastal risk in the sea, in the sea coast project with the follow on of setting sail. And I'll get into that later. And then also just uh, what our communities have actually implemented uh, as a result of those two capstone projects. And then the lessons that we learned from working with our communities um, through, that, through those planning processes. So a little bit about the Coastal Adaptation Work Group and what we do. Our mission is to help is to create resilient and healthy communities, sustainable communities throughout the seacoast by giving them tool, providing tools, technical assistance, and educate, educating them about various topics relating to climate change and climate adaptation. We, this group began as an, we are still an ad hoc work, working group. We have no charter, we have no um, MOU, we have no, we just, we, we meet uh, voluntarily. Uh, we are consisting of 23 different partners, different agencies, state, federal, local, municipalities, um, government, um, academia, and, and nonprofits. And over the course of uh, eight years, since we started in 2010, we have leveraged, um, sorry. 96 projects that were worth $6.5 million. Um, and that ranges from everything from <clears throat> applied research, uh, community outreach, planning, assessment uh, across the board. And we, we could never have done that without our federal partners, um, many that are listed here, as well as some of our state agencies, including Homeland Security and Emergency Management through FEMA, and also um, uh, the Northeast Region Ocean Council. We transitioned recently to our new logo, which is pretty fancy, uh, because this is our used to be our logo. <laughs> All of our partners, uh, and it was, it's not a very portable logo. It gets really messy and difficult to. Do, but we decided we needed to brand ourselves. Uh, people know, know us very widely, well and widely uh, in, in, the, in the Northeast region, actually, and we have presented at national conferences and um, been very competitive nationally for national grant grant programs over the years. So we wanted to become a little bit more official. But the one thing I wanted to talk about the Coastal Adaptation Work Group is its strength. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
And its biggest strength is that we work as a group. Um, we work together, we work in partnership. We speak as sort of a unified voice. We have an outreach committee that meets monthly that helps with communications and planning our events. Um, but our group is very, uh, very tight knit. We've all, most of us have worked together for a number of years and that's actually how we started in the first place. It was just a small group of people, professionals working in the seacoast who had a professional interest in working on climate change, which back in 2010, you couldn't even say the word climate change in New Hampshire without getting a hairy, hairy eyeball thrown your way. <laughs> Uh, or a, you shouldn't talk about that. Uh, so we actually, when we came up with our name, Coastal Adaptation Work Group, we wanted to be the Climate Adaptation Work Group, but you know that we weren't sure that was going to fly. So uh, we have advanced the, dis the dialogue and the discussion in Seacoast, New Hampshire, and I think throughout New Hampshire about climate adaptation and about the impacts to our state. Uh, with respect to climate change, and we did that again as a unified voice and as a as a as a partnership moving forward, and I think that our partnership is one of the things that our funders actually look toward and look at as a, a huge strength when, when applying for grant pro, um, pro, programs, that we work so effectively together and we have these in very solid working relationships. So that's, I think, um, a just a, I think because of our geography, we only have 17 coastal communities, that means head of tide and Atlantic coast communities, unlike Massachusetts, we have way more shoreline than we do, but we have a small geography with all the same players uh, operating at the federal, uh, state, and local level in a very small area, and that also helps us be more cohesive and um, work in, any, in a unified manner. So we have that going for us. So I wanted to move on and talk a little bit about our, our two capstone projects. Um, most, one of them was led by the New Hampshire, by the Rockingham Planning Commission mostly, and the other uh, by the partners in the Coastal Adaptation work, work Group, including the Rockingham Planning Commission. But first, I want to just give an example about how progress can be messy and how c communities don't always have a straightforward path and that they can be thrown off at any minute. <laughs> My case study is the town of Rye. Uh, they had a, had a rocky road ahead of, uh, behind them um, as far as being a resilient community and trying to work on um, climate adaptation um, measures and, and strategies. So we had a series of workshops way back when in 2013. We formed a climate committee, uh, the Tides to Storms assessment, I'll talk about that later, that came on, on, online. The planner became, uh, town's planner became a certified floodplain manager. We started an enrollment pro re enrollment process into the CR community rating system for FEMA. They had been in the program before, um, but were no longer in it, so we started working on getting them back into the program. Um, they had a representative, a very strong representative, on the New Hampshire Coastal Risks and Hazards Commission, which just finished its work last year, actually, and published a re comprehensive report. This is a governor's, a governor's working group, um, a go governor's uh, commission that were, looked at climate change and looked at coastal flooding issues across the seacoast. And it was represented by state, lo uh, local, municipal, and nonprofit, and the business, business community. And it was a really effective um, effort. And I could go on and just spend my whole time talking about it, but I won't. You can go, go online and find their, their report. Um, and then the planner wins our Coastal Adaptation Work Group's Climate Champion Award. Um, and we created an ad adaptation chapter for their master plan re recent, recently, which I'll talk about again. We're going to be starting working on a high water mark initiative in, in, the, in the town to benchmark high water or sea, uh, sea level rise elevations as well as um, sort of, uh, past storm elevations. And the representative from the Coastal Risk and Hazards Commission was actually elected a selectman, which brings a lot of weight towards making decisions about climate adaptation in the future. However, there were a few bumps in this, this, this somewhat um, celebrated road. Um, they got kicked out of the CRS back in 2012 for having non-compliant structures in their floodplain. Um, someone contested the new uh, flood insurance rate maps that were done for, for Rockingham County, so th those have not, they're still in preliminary phase, they have not been adopted yet because of that, that um, um, person was contesting some of the information on the maps in Rye. And a civic group is very much active in the community. And ironically, <laughs> they are charging that the town's not doing enough about climate adaptation. And so they've been kind of sticking, putting the stick to the town to do more and um, spend more money. And it's, but it's, it's been a little bit of a contentious um, issue because they're, they're, they're one of moving far ahead and fi faster ahead than the town is actually able to do. So that's been a little bit of a sticking point. So this is just an example of how you know, climate adaptation and, and the progress, progress towards resiliency is not a a direct path, and there, you never know when you're, you're going to be um, sidelined by, by anything. 
And then what to do with the shale piles. Before we started working with rye, nobody knew where the shale piles were. They're unconsolidated berms that align root, uh, large sections of Route 1A in, in, in rye. And when large storms come in, all that shale ends up in the road or across the street in, this, in, this, in the salt marsh or freshwater ponds. And they are constantly, um, uh, it's an irritation for them. The, DO, the Department of Transportation has decided that just keeping the shale piles the way they are is, is their best course of business, at least for now. They're not willing to actually change them or do anything to them at the moment. But Always, it always comes up in every conversation we have about climate adaptation. What are we going to do about the shale piles? Um, <clears throat> so, but regardless of the stumbling blocks that our, our, many of our communities have experienced over the years, they, they are committed to moving forward in a very tangible way. And I'll let you know what they did. So our first project was in 2014, 2016, called Tides to Storms. This is a Rockingham Planning Commission-led project funded through Home and Security and Emergency Management, followed on by a um, implementation project called Tides to Storms II, which was funded through the Northeast Region Ocean Council. <coughs> and then our second project, which we're just concluding now, is called Sea Rise, or Climate Risk in the Seacoast. This is a project of special merit funded by through NOAA. And then the other companion piece, this is called Setting Sail, which is the implementation phase of this project. Again, another project of special merit award through NOAA. Um, so both, both, both of these projects basically use the same methodology uh, um, modeled after the tides to storms, which we did a vulnerability assessment. And we, we, we evaluated the effects of sea level rise and storm surge on uh, critical facilities, transportation assets, and natural resources. We created maps. We, ca we created a regional report for all of our communities. We created individual reports for each of the municipalities. And so all that stuff is on our website. You can look at it. I really don't want to talk about the findings necessarily. I want to really focus on the process, which is really what I came here to talk to you about. So. Um, the Ties to Storms project, the geography, was the seven Atlantic coastal communities. We started with them first, and then we then got the success of grants, and we worked with our 10 inland coast, uh, coastal communities along Great Bay. Um, the projects focused on uh, a very uh, strategic manner, how we approach the communities, and that we wanted to reach decision makers. We thought the decision makers and the communities were the f people that needed to hear this information first and foremost, understand it, and understand how they could use it in the future. And I have to say, I was shaking in my boots a little bit, approaching some of the towns for the very first time and saying, hey, can you get together a committee of your EM, your emergency management director, your police and fire, your planner, your DPW guy, your road agent, you know, and, and your planners and come to a series of meetings and see what we have to show you. And I have to say that every single community stepped up to the plate. They went through a series of anywhere between three to five meetings, two hours, sometimes three hours at a time. They invested a huge amount of capital at the local level to participate in this project. Um, they thought it was Im incredibly important to understand the information, and they, uh, I was just really blown away at their level of participation. After being afraid to utter the words climate change, we kind of softened the approach. We didn't talk much about sea level rise necessarily. We looked at, we talked about changing weather patterns, extreme weather. We focused a lot on uh, what they, they actually are seeing on the ground today as like nuisance flooding, like in King Tai that just happened earlier this week and uh, coastal erosion, stormwater management, and, and, co and, and coastal freshwater flooding. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the project outcomes, because I think that the, this is the implementation part, which each one of the communities actually worked on. So Newcastle um, did a lot of community outreach. They have, were working on a uh, change to a buffer ordinance to uh, expand uh, and, and increase buffer setbacks. And they thought this would be a perfect time to talk about the whole idea of flood storage in the coastal, in the coastal area of, uh, of Newcastle, being an island that has a lot of, a lot of coastal water. Um, Hampton Falls also did a lot of coast, uh, outreach specifically to two neighborhoods which were particularly impacted by the flooding according to our maps. Uh, they didn't really have a lot of infrastructure impacts. It was mostly residential neighborhoods. And we also, they were also in the process of doing a master plan update. And so we created some recommendations across all the chapters that were being updated that relate to climate adaptation and resiliency. Um, <clears throat> two of our coastal communities, uh, Atlantic coastal communities, adapt, adopted new master plan chapters, and they were um, enabled by a, a legislative statute that was changed a couple of years ago, amended, and to allow coastal communities to actually uh, adopt coastal hazards chapters in their master plan. And so we, these are the first two ever in, the, in New Hampshire, and Seabrook adopted theirs last year, and it's, um, 
RISE in the process of up updating their, um, adopting theirs now as a project part of a master plan update. Portsmouth, we worked with them to look at zoning, zoning and building codes, ways that we could actually change zoning to uh, make sure that new development and redevelopment on the landscape would be more resilient and, and less, less impacted by flooding. And we came up with a, a technical memo for them. Northampton uh, looked at incorporating flood storage standards into their buffer setbacks and ordinances using the maps as a guide to expand buffers where, where necessary to accommodate um, long-term sea level rise flooding. In Hampton, um, we developed, uh, we completely rewrote their floodplain ordinance for them, including a one-foot freeboard requirement, which requires um, new, new buildings and substantial uh, reconstruction of buildings to be elevated one foot above the 100-year flood elevation, the, ba the base flood elevation, and that passed at town meeting this, this March. So moving ahead to our Sea Rise project, which was our inland tidal coastal communities and our setting sail, uh, five of those communities are in the Rockingham Planning Commission region and five are in Stratford Regional Planning Commission. So we worked with five communities. Um, Newington, did, is, it, we're in the process of doing outreach to businesses along the Piscataqua River. This is their working waterfront and they have Sprague Energy, they've got a lobster company, they've got a couple other businesses and a marina that could be heavily impacted by sea level rise in the future. So we are re giving them copies of the maps and reports, sitting down, talking with them and letting them know the information is available and how they could potentially use it. Uh, Greenland is actually doing the same coastal hazards and climate adaptation chapter for their master plan in the moment. At the moment, it's in draft form. Um, in Exeter, we're doing public outreach. We are a follow-on to a previous project. Um, we're going to do a public open house, bringing together all the all the climate-related related, uh, activities that they have accomplished in the last five years, which is quite a lot, including a climate resolution to uh, to. Um, acknowledge the, the Paris Accord that just happened recently. So we're going to have a public open house, which is going to have stations and uh, areas for public input where they can actually talk about what their, their climate-related climate, climate related, um, concerns are, uh, the, the public, that is. And we're actually up, help, we're helping to up, update their stormwater management regulations to include climate resiliency and climate adaptation factors into their stormwater regulation. And Stratum is doing outreach to two of their far major farms that are in Stratum. Uh, they're both uh, along the tidal um, shores of the Squamscott River and have substantial areas of, the, of their working uh, landscape that could be affected by flooding. So we're doing outreach to them and as well doing a, a master plan chapter for that community. And the five communities in Stratford Regional Planning Commission's planning region, these are just to be north, north of, say, Portsmouth and north and west of Portsmouth. Uh, Rollinser is working on a grant proposal to do a culvert replacement. Um, Dover is doing, a, again, a master plan chapter. And this is a very, um, it's a citywide effort. It's, it's been incredible. They've been having listening circles and public meetings and having enormous turnout at public events, including lots of younger people that we normally don't see at these meetings. So it's been quite a, quite a comprehensive effort in the city of Dover. Um, Madbury's was, is doing public outreach again. And Durham is doing an overlay dis district in their zoning ordinance. So this would be a, s a district, district based on the flood um, maps of sea level rise, and they're going to pick a sea level rise scenario with which to define the district, so a flood elevation of some, of some sort. And uh, they're going to develop um, specific standards in that, that overlay district for new development and redevelopment. And Newmarket is updating their stormwater regulations. So I wanted to go on, move on to what did we learn? This is probably, we wrote this up as a part of our report to the Northeast Region Ocean Council as part of our Tides to Storms 2 um, project, and also it's been tweaked a little bit as a result of our Sea Rise project and setting sail. Um, but it's really important, I think, to reflect back on the, the, the po components of these projects that, that actually made a difference, and that actually were the, the sort of the stars of the show. Uh, with respect to the, how successful these two projects have been. You can tell just by the number of actions. Each one of our, our, our what's we have, 16 of the, co of the 17 coastal communities are moving forward with recommendations that came out of these assessments and the reports. Um, but it wouldn't have happened unless they had ex this external technical assistance. Someone sitting there, organizing the meetings, bringing the notes, explaining the information, and being there to... Um, to help them through a process and to, to show them what the process is. And again, that's a, that's a result of customized and sustained technical assistance, um, but also from a known provider. The Rockingham Planning Commission staff have very close ties with all the communities in our coastal region, as well as Stratford Regional Planning Commission. We sort of are the known entity. We're sort of the, the known entity in the neighborhood as far as a t uh, technical service providers. <clears throat> 
And so they, they trust the information, they trust us, they, they know our track record, and so I think that went a long way towards them coming to, coming to the plate and, and working with us so closely. And this one is really important, this next, next bullet, that municipalities were confident to act knowing their actions were justified and supported by a solid foundation of local data, not nationwide data or global data, maps and assessments, and providing a context for how that knowledge could actually be translated and used by the community, and, and, and they felt more confident in acting because of that. So what I mean by that is that the known context is, how does it fit in your master plan? How does it fit in your zoning? How do, would you change your regulation or a standard to actually achieve some of the goals that you want, whether it's reducing flooding or addressing stormwater? So showing them sort of the path forward. How do you actually um, incorporate this stuff into your daily business? <clears throat> And this also is a really interesting one too, that even surrounding the uncertainty around uncertainty and maybe some disagreement about what's causing climate change, um, they already see, these communities already see flooding in their, in, in, even in, on sunny days. So we had king tide the other day. Sometimes it can just be a, a terrible wind coming up through the Hampton Seabrook estuary that causes flooding. And they see their stormwater systems being impacted, their roads being impacted, and, and neighborhoods being impacted such that people can't even bring their cars home anymore and park them in the driveway because they have flooding too, so, so often. And so the communities feel like even that there is a, a, there is a, st a strong need to act now, to start working on, on adopting actions now, because we've had so many, few, few, so many near misses of storms here in the Northeast that it's only a matter of time before, before one actually is on our doorstep again. And this is a really good one, too. They're all good, actually. <laughs> Um, that municipalities have a strong sense of responsibility to respond to this information and to raise awareness, to, to bring it to their community members and to incorporate it into the way they, everything, the way they do business. And I think this was, was very uh, evident even in the first meetings we had with these communities. We sat down, they took it seriously. The town managers you know, said, you, know, you, you, you all department heads will be here and you're gonna be here for two hours and we're going to actually have a conversation about this stuff. And so they did take it seriously and I, I really give them all the credit, actually, for the success of, this, of these two projects, the, the, the two assessment projects. It really did hinge on the communities being bold, bold participants and willing participants. And they've shown that they learned a lot from the process. They've shown that they're willing, willing to take action and incorporate the information and make changes. And they recognize that their communities may not look the same in the next 10, 20, 50, 100 years, and that they need to accept that, that change is inevitable and to embrace that change could, could potentially be a good thing too. There could be some bright sides to, to it. Um, and the other thing is that they, they learned that working together um, with the neighboring communities and municipalities is, is also a good thing. In New Hampshire, our 230 something towns are very much uh, entrenched in their town boundaries. They like to do everything by themselves. That's kind of the New Hampshire way. Every, they, every, every town reinvents the wheel of almost everything they do, but it's their brand and their, their, you know, their product. But there are many instances in the conversations around these, ta these, these working group tables that they, the towns recognize the need to work together on things like evacuation route planning, um, drinking water supplies that could be impacted, uh, transportation infrastructure, um, and uh, what was the other thing? Out. Oh, and also, I'm sorry, they're natural resources. They, also, they, share, they share many, uh, the great the Seabrook, Hampton Seabrook estuary is a huge salt marsh, and they recognize that they need to all work towards, uh, for example, uh, evaluating where marsh migration can happen around their, the edges and the borders of their tidal waters. A very important thing for flood storage and also for habitat preservation, recognizing that these communities are all recreation and tourism based, and that's in their best interest to, to keep the, that base across the seaboard uh, sustainable and um, into the future. But also they also recognize, I think, and there are a lot of tough cells in the room about taking federal money. A lot of people were asking us, the, um, especially the town managers and others, well, where's, this money, how, where's the money coming from to do all this work? Where do, where do you get your money from? And they recognize the importance and the value of partnering with the federal, federal agencies like NOAA and EPA and HUD and others to bring money to the table to be able to fund this, 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 this work. Because otherwise, um, if we didn't have that money, we'd never be able to do this. The towns would, would not have come up with the money themselves and uh, this work would never have gone forward. And so that was, a, a, I think, an interesting lesson that you know, 
partnering with, with the federal government is not a bad thing always. <laughs> it can be very beneficial to you. And so I, I was struck this by this morning by the conversations about how much Massachusetts has invested in climate adaptation and you actually have an office of climate change. Wow, what a novel idea. <laughs> We're trying to get a climate change coordinator statewide. Um, that, that's a, our, our current struggle. And also the fact that we only have 17 coastal communities in New Hampshire. Imagine if, if, this, if the state just gave $20,000 to each one of those communities like every other year or every five years or whatever. That's a minor investment. That's less than fifty-five. That's less than five hundred thousand dollars, which is a, a drop in the bucket for a state budget. Um, but our 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 state is slow to get moving um, at the state level. Uh, it's been a hard sell to, to start looking at climate change in a very tangible way. But the climate adaptation worker was not going to slow down. We're not going to give up. Uh, we're going to keep moving. We're going to keep applying for those federal grants and, and getting you know, millions of dollars to brought to our state. And I think that the more we can en enable and embolden our communities to have a voice in their, in their state government, the long, the, uh, we're hoping that, that, that the, balance of, the balance of power will change a little bit and that money will start to trickle, trickle in from the state, from the state to, to deal with some of these issues. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that um, the project, all these project materials, the maps, the reports, everything are on our websites and we're loading the products as they're being pr produced and finished. So you can see examples of some of the work that our communities have done. I guess I just wanted to, to end, end with an, a note, on a note that um, this has really been an odyssey, I think, for New Hampshire, going through this process of looking at um, doing vulnerability assessments and having such a close dialogue with our communities. And it really has opened up, I think, our relationship with our communities and relationships with each other. They come to our workshops now and they, we show a sea level rise graph, graph and they don't even blink an eye. They know, they understand the lingo, they understand the vernacular, um, they're conversant in climate change and climate adaptation and resiliency. They use the words and the terminology. And so I think in the last five to seven years, <coughs> forging these close relationships have really moved the ball forward with respect to having an open dialogue, which I think someone mentioned before about that. <coughs> and they're right, the, and the, the towns also recognize the need to expand that dialogue to the general pub public. Because not only are there things that, that the town is responsible for as, as far as like zoning and regula land use regulations, but there are a lot of things that private property owners can do to secure their own property and make sure that the investments that they make are sound and well-founded in good science. And I think that, that this is the, the next step, I think, for New Hampshire is to try and get, trying to cast that, 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 um, that net a little wider, capture more people, uh, talk to groups, I think, that we maybe had overlooked or maybe hadn't reached out to before, and try and get the word out and get a more comprehensive sort of um, groundswell going at the local level in the communities. So I think that's all I have for today. So our next speaker is uh, Daniel Brown. Uh, Dan is the Climate Change Program Coordinator for Mass Audubon. He works on projects in education, science, and advocacy. And prior to his current role, he was a climatologist at the Great Lakes Integrated Sciences and Assessment Center and a researcher at the Oregon Climate Change Research Institute. Uh, Daniel holds a master's degree in nuclear physics from Michigan State University and a master's degree in atmospheric science from Oregon State University. Dan. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to be talking about uh, Ongoing work down in the Taunton watershed that involves a large network of people. I'll be talking mostly about uh, a specific project that I was involved in, that, that Mass Audubon was deeply involved in. But this is, this is part of a much larger ongoing uh, set of what I think is pretty inspiring work uh, in that part of the state. So our town, or the the Resilient Taunton Watershed Network uh, is a partnership of a bunch of federal, state, uh, local agencies. This, this set that I have up on the slide right now, I think represents kind of the core partners of, of the work that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, we were blessed with a lot of really great champions in, in each of these organizations. Uh, Bill Napolitano, in particular, down at SERPED, 
uh, is a great resource. If, if you're not familiar with him, as you're thinking through these issues, he's a great person to talk to. He knows everybody, uh, knows how to get things done uh, in the state. Uh, we also had a great uh, champion in the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, which as you can imagine is uh, dealing with its own culture challenges at the moment. Uh, so she knows who she is and, and she's my hero uh, of the year, I think. Uh, so this is, this is work to, to really draw the watershed together around climate adaptation like we've been hearing uh, about throughout the day. And I think you're gonna hear a lot of the same themes uh, that keep recurring. Uh, and that's some, a lot of the things we've heard about throughout the day are things that I have learned or have noticed as I've been working in different watersheds or different communities across the country, whether it's Pacific Northwest, the Midwest, uh, Massachusetts. A lot of these ideas keep coming up. Uh, so we'll, we'll come back to those. But why are we, why are we thinking or why is, why is Mass Audubon in particular interested in working in the Taunton watershed. And our interest really goes back to our losing ground report where we surveyed uh, where development was happening across Massachusetts, how fast, uh, where was the important uh, natural open space still available for protection in the Commonwealth. Uh, the Taunton watershed is in what we call the sprawl frontier, which if you imagine a map of Massachusetts, that's sort of the 495 beltway, uh, other pockets, uh, and particularly southeastern Massachusetts at large. So it's developing rapidly. It is the fastest developing watershed in the state. Uh, it's home to a lot of critical natural resources um, that I would say are undervalued uh, compared to other parts of the state. Uh, so the Taunton Wild and Scenic River is the longest undammed coastal river in New England. It's a beautiful river, but in many places there's no access to the river. So far few, fewer people, I think, know about it than, than other great resources in the Commonwealth. Uh, it's a large contributor to the, uh, of fresh water to the Narragansett Bay. Uh, and there's a huge opportunity for conservation success in that watershed. So about 60% of the land down there is undeveloped, uh, and only about 15% of the land is protected. So we have, in many ways, a, a blank slate in which to work. So the, the goals of our town are pretty similar to the goals that you've heard uh, from the other groups throughout today. Uh, we want to make the Taunton watershed more resilient in the face of climate change and rapid development. We want to address the ecological, economic, social issues associated with climate change. It's not just about those physical changes that we're seeing. And what is really the ongoing part of the work is really guiding officials and residents of the watershed on climate adaptation planning. It, I think what, what many of the people in this room would tell you is that it's, it's a lot of work to pull a report together and do a vulnerability assessment and really figure out where you, you need to apply your efforts, but then it's that ongoing work. It's, it's beyond bringing people together, it's actually keeping people together over a sustained amount of time that is really important. Uh, so that's one of our goals with this Our Town Network, is to really operate as a network. So why do we think about climate change? And I'm asking this question uh, not just in the context of you know, why do we want to plan for climate change, but, but what are the messages that really resonate with community members as we go out and try to share this information? We had a lot of interest uh, before lunch in, you know, how do we get people on board with talking or thinking about climate change, integrating these ideas into everything that we do? Uh, and as you heard, I started out, you know, in this very, with this very quantitative background, looking at climate models, looking at historical climate data, and over time, uh, just by necessity, I've, I've been pulled into looking more and more at the, the social data of how do you really land these, these ideas with people? How do you get these ideas to stick? And one thing that is really important to get across, specifically for New England, because we don't face a lot of these 
uh, catastrophic events that you see on the news, uh, aside from things like Hurricane Sandy, um, you know, we don't see these, these massive forest fires or melting ice caps or these things that seem sort of otherworldly. But in fact, the message that really is important that affects people's daily lives is that these challenges that we already face, these nuisance flooding, the fact that when you have just a little bit of rain, your commute in the morning is that much harder to get through. And that those kind of weather events are going to increase in the future. Climate change amplifies the existing vulnerabilities, the threats, the challenges that we, that we already face. That turns out to be a key message. Then another thing we find is that throwing just an incredible amount of data at people, no matter how clear and overwhelming and compelling that data is, does not alone compel people to action. You have to address the values that people are thinking about. And there are a lot of values that you can touch on as you're doing this, this kind of work. We're thinking about hazard mitigation. The Pentagon calls climate change a threat multiplier, and they still call climate change a threat multiplier. Economic values, different social values. There, there are lots of things that people care about that we can touch on to make these, these messages, to make this data and this outlook on climate change stick. But there are a few that really broadly resonate. And the first is that we want to do this for future generations, for public health. So as much as we can weave that message into our materials, into our outreach, our engagement, that can really move things forward pretty rapidly. The next piece is that we all want to be responsible stewards of where we live. We want the world to be a better place because we were here. We heard a little bit about that uh, in earlier presentations. This idea of responsible management is critically important. Uh, so in that, we want to be more economically resilient. And then we want to make our communities more livable. And what I mean by that is that we, we want to make our communities places where people want to live. All right? I think we're already there for this part of the state. This is a, a beautiful part of the state. But as we look at you know, the old model of getting people to move to an area, uh, you know, sort of the, the post-World War II model of come to our town, we have the industry, we have the jobs, we have the opportunities. That model has not been working over the last several decades as it did in the past. What many places across the country are finding is that people move to the place where they want to live and they find a way to make the jobs work once they get there. So this idea of making a community livable, making a community attractive to raise a family, get started that way, and they bring the jobs with them. Uh, that is a value uh, that turns out to be pretty powerful to engage. But we do want to make sure we give people the critical information about climate change, what's happening, key impacts. So up, up here now I have really the four key physical changes in climate that I would want everybody in Massachusetts to know. This, uh, this is information that got pulled into the MVP curriculum, so the MVP service providers are seeing the same information. Uh, most of these numbers come from the National Climate Assessment or other uh, publicly available data sources. So our temperatures have gone up about three degrees Fahrenheit. That's faster than the national and global rates since 1895. Our growing season is longer by about 10 days. We heard about how that's really an indicator for all sorts of change around public health, uh, changing in phenology, things like that. Our sea levels, of course, are rising, already 10 inches or more as measured in Boston Harbor. And then most importantly, our strongest storms are dropping about 71% more precipitation cumulatively than in the past. So the shorthand for this is that more of our precipitation is coming to us in big gulps rather than small sips. And that includes things like our big coastal storms, our great big thunder boomers, the moisture that we see along the coast, but it also applies to inland storms as well. So this is, this is one key factor I think that gets, 
that gets lost as we're talking about sea level rise and coastal impacts. Uh, this idea of stronger storms, more runoff, really resonates with inland areas. So those are the, the four big changes. Uh, there's one that applies to Western Mass, which is a loss of snow cover. We won't go into that. Uh, but from kind of these four big changes, you can find kind of all of the key changes that we face in our communities. More extreme heat days, changes in drought, changes in snow melt, uh, changes in freeze-thaw cycles, all of these different indicators that we look at uh, that, that give us challenges. So it all comes back to, I think, one of these four things. That change in precipitation, extreme precipitation, this map is just to show you that uh, it is a distinctly northeast issue. Uh, Great Lakes region has also seen this. They've seen it in the south and across the Great Plains, but it is something that we are dealing with in the northeast more than the rest of the country. And with that, uh, one thing we find when we're, when we're talking to uh, communities is that these, these bigger storms have changed over time, uh, but many communities, either by bylaw or state guideline, are using data that uh, actually ended about 1960. So it started from about 1930 to 1960. That's that NOAA TP40. So when you look at what size storm should you expect over a 24-hour period, what's your 100-year design storm, and then you look at more recent data that ended, I think, about 2015, uh, which is called NOAA Atlas 14. You can see that across Taunton, Boston, Worcester, there's sort of three really good stations across the state. You can see that that 100-year, 24-hour storm has increased in all cases by about 15 to 22% or so. so in many cases, our communities are designing for storms uh, just based on obsolete historical data, not even planning for changes in storm size that are coming in the near future. But we're already you know, 60, 70 years out of date in terms of the storm size that we consider. This is just one example of the types of information of, of really finding these key points, these key bottlenecks uh, in, in the climate data uh, where communities can take action. So a community might look at this, and many have, where they say, yep, we're using NOAA TP40. We didn't realize that we shouldn't do that. Let's start looking at NOAA Atlas 14. We just did one of the MVP workshops in Natick. Sure enough, uh, talked about this, and, and they're going to try to make that change. Um, so identifying these, these little sort of hidden stumbling blocks um, based on the data is, is critically important. But even once we go, we go through all that um, and we start thinking about, you know, what are the solutions, what are the strategies to combat climate change going forward, one thing we, we keep coming back to is we can look at how much things have changed over time, we can look at projections going forward, but then what type of solution do you put in place? Uh, and we talk a lot about green infrastructure, so you replace a roadway, you narrow a roadway, you put in rain gardens, etc. use permeable pavement, all these things we talk about that are good strategies. But as we start thinking about sea level rise or big changes, sea level rise doesn't stop at 2100. It's, it's going to continue. Regardless of what we do, it's going to continue uh, in some fashion. So do you, how, how far do you elevate houses? How far back do you retreat? What size culverts do you put uh, under roadways. Do you plan for 2070? Do you plan for 2150? If you plan for 2070, you're going to have to tear them out, put in something for 2150. This, this problem, when it comes up, especially among engineers, I can make fun of them because my brother's an engineer, they, they really don't like this, this type of question or thinking because we are very good as a civilization of identifying a problem and then fixing it figuring out what we need and fixing it, whether that's green infrastructure, gray infrastructure, what have you. It just comes down usually to, to finances. But climate change completely upends that thinking. It's not just now about fixing the problem for the future. What future are you fixing for? So there isn't a new normal that we can plan for. There's only next normals. So 
how do you deal with that? And the answer is, well, no, really the best solution is to let nature do its thing. It's to preserve as much open space as you can, let marshes migrate, move around, take care of themselves. They're generally pretty good at it compared to what we can do uh, on the landscape. So as we talk about green infrastructure solutions, and uh, Manomet uh, is, is the group that pulled together a, a lot of this information, really looking at what solutions work and why. You know, we, a lot of things that we've talked about already today, limiting peak runoff rates, maximizing natural resiliency of coastal areas, uh, limit new development in flood-prone er, flood, flood areas, uh, maintaining ecological viability, diversity, and, and so forth. So that's what we really want to do with green infrastructure. We communicate this with, uh, with the different workshops that we do. Uh, then we also provide uh, res resilience case studies. And I would say this is one of our most uh, requested resource as we work with the different communities down there. Um, so it's really, here's, here's what happened in this community. Here's how they did it start to finish. Here's how they got grant funding. Here's who they partnered with. Uh, here's the data that they use to make the decision. Uh, one that we talk about a lot, which the slide's too dark to, to show you up here, but the uh, Winton, Whittington Pond Dam uh, removal project, which I think was on uh, the national news a few years ago. Um, you know, it was a failing dam. They removed it. There was a lot of concern about what would happen uh, to that resource, that pond that was behind the dam. Uh, turns out, actually, the residents are much happier now that that, that area has been restored to a much more uh, natural state. Um, so it's just one example of, of the types of case studies um, that we provide. There's a lot around you know, just uh, good best management practices for marshlands, other wetlands, <laughs> uh, culvert replacement, you know, the, the types of things that come up pretty commonly. Uh, in that Whittington Dam removal project, you know, looking at the benefits, you know, we saw fewer al algal blooms, improved water quality, improved fish passage, passage and habitat. Uh, the community noticed improved safety, increased property values, increased recreational opportunities. Uh, the cost to benefit ratio was clearly in the favor of, of removing the dam and restoring it to this natural state, uh, 0.5 million versus a repair cost of 1.9 million, and a DER study, uh, you know, each $1 million spent on restoration supported 10 to 13 jobs, and 1.5 and to 1.8 million in economic output. So that's good data, but more importantly, that hits on this idea of, no, there is a lot of value for this spot as a resource to the community, both economically and as a recreational opportunity. So what we did most recently, uh, and the, the project I was most involved with, um, was you know, pulling together the climate information for a series of workshops that we kind of did like. So this is the Taunton watershed here. We did the series of five workshops, two days uh, in each community, kind of like spokes of a wheel going around the watershed. Uh, and they weren't limited to any one community or any, any few communities. Uh, so we got a pretty, pretty broad mix of people coming, uh, both from inside and outside of the watershed uh, to the different workshops. But for the people that were in each of those communities, we had them go through this process first before they actually heard about uh, the climate information of where do you see your vulnerabilities now? So not even thinking about climate change or any of the data, where do you see your, your vulnerabilities? What's, where are the issues now? And then we give them the climate information, we say, Okay, how are those spots, do you think, going to be affected by climate change now having this climate information in your back pocket? And that was kind of our day one program. So they identify these spots, they identify whether or not they think the vulnerability is going to increase, decrease, stay the same over time. That's the first day. We'd come back a week or two later. Uh, the folks at Manomet would do a really good job of getting all of the data points up onto a map. We'd go through each one of those points, talk about it in day two as, as we talk about solutions and solution options. 
So the other layer on this map, uh, so this is just the broad watershed view, and then this is zooming in uh, to Dighton, which is one of the communities we worked in, uh, with several of the points for, for areas that were identified as vulnerable. Uh, so we'd, we'd come back and you know, all of the areas in green were areas that we had identified as the Taunton's Green Infrastructure Network, which is the more novel part of, of uh, the data aggregation for this project. So not just looking at what are the most resilient, uh, valuable areas from an ecological standpoint in one community, but how do these areas connect to each other throughout the watershed. So we often had uh, people from neighboring communities, oftentimes where there had been some sort of conflict over water usage or, or some other uh, past history. And they're looking at this idea of protection, stormwater management, other vulnerabilities through this lens of climate change. In all cases, we would see sort of this broadening of viewpoint, you know, this, what, what I call the climate change wide angle lens. So if, if you've been working in a specific department and you look at your system through this, this lens of climate change, it forces you to think about a system of systems. So we often found groups um, with tense relationships in the past really coming together thinking, yeah, we need to figure out how we can work on this together. So again, involving multiple communities uh, is, a, is a great strategy. So thinking about this green infrastructure network um, and, and how you can link, you know, create links, protect land in that green infrastructure network, whether that's in a sensitive riparian area um, or another ecologically uh, resilient area in one of the other data layers, you know, thinking about how you can operationally protect land or link up into that green infrastructure network. We provide a lot of mechanisms of, for linkage and ways to do that. So things like integrating, how do you integrate into your comprehensive your mas master plan, uh, what subdivision requirements are good to use. Uh, open space districts, transfer of development rights, water research, resource protection overlay districts, um, what are good flood plain management strategies, uh, how do you update open space plans, bylaws, really what are the nuts and bolts, the operational steps you can take to really enhance this connected network of green infrastructure in the watershed. And another set of key resources um, and these top two are, are on the Mass Audubon website uh, that are often requested uh, are these LID fact sheets, of which there are five. Uh, and that takes you through the whole process really from what is a green infrastructure, what does it do, what are the benefits, to how do you get this changed in your local bylaws? How do you engage as a, as a citizen or a manager uh, to, really, to really get this done. So it really is this operational guidebook for low impact design. And that's, that's everything from putting in rain gardens or rain barrels up to how do you design a subdivision uh, more effectively. The other resource that we often uh, talk about and have had a lot of success with is Mass Audubon's Mapper tool, which allows you uh, through a series of pretty quick steps to uh, look at different, uh, different parcels in terms of how resilient they are to climate change and other factors. So if, if, you, if you just want to get a quick assessment, you can get on there, just hit the balance model, sort of keep it with the defaults uh, and let the map run. But then you can zoom into your own town, you can find parcels that are valuable um, in your own community for land protection, uh, ecological resilience, that sort of thing. And there are a number of data layers that go into that tool. Uh, so the, the Biomap to Habitat Biodiversity layers, uh, the TNC Resilience layer, uh, and then this idea of critical linkages and connectivity all play into this mapper tool. Um, and we've had 
several people in various communities across the state come up to us afterwards, a lot of times where we hadn't even worked with them in the past, and say, yeah, I used your tool the other day, and you know, we're thinking about uh, you know, one of these three parcels that you recommend. So it's, it's a really good first step, particularly for communities that don't have a lot of resources to do an assessment themselves about what land to protect and where. Uh, and this is just a walkthrough uh, for the different mappers. So the first, uh, for, for how you would select something in mapper, so you select a study area, you choose a model, and then there's different values for which you can choose the model, resilient sites for conservation, critical linkages, etc. Uh, and then you can run and review the results so you can play with the map. It is actually a fun tool to play with. It's one that you can scroll around like Google Maps and, and have some fun with. And then this is just a quick snapshot of what it looks like in Halifax. So you can see the different parcels pulled out uh, and scored based on their resiliency. So just to close, um, you know, there, there are several themes I think you heard throughout the day. I hope some of them came out. Um, as I've been talking, you know, where, when I've worked in these types of projects before in different watersheds, uh, different parts of the country, always one key for success is to conclude all levels of accountability in the communities that you're working in. Uh, so that's people that are on the ground actually running the things day to day, project managers, but it, that also includes different scales. So community scales, watershed scale, federal agencies for the region. Another key factor, which I think is supremely important when we're talking about climate change, is to use consistent messaging. Don't try to reinvent the wheel in terms of messaging. Don't try to find clever ways to talk about climate change in maybe a way that somebody hasn't done before. When we try to come up with new ways like that and we deviate from something like the National Climate Assessment or the work that Northeast Climate Science Center is doing, what that does is it creates confusion and it actually allows people that are looking for uncertainty or misinformation to gain a foothold. So you want to use consistent messaging across all the communities involved. Uh, and that's a particularly important if you're looking at something tangible like the Great Marsh. Uh, you want to make sure you're talking about it all in the same way. And then you want to follow a framework. And as we heard in detail from Katie, uh, we have an absolutely fantastic framework from the Nature Conservancy and our state uh, to really do this work, this engagement work in each of our communities and build on that. Uh, so again, rather than try to come up with something new, put our own town stamp on it, it's really good to just steal the idea outright. Um, from the MVP framework or somewhere else. So with that, just point you again to the website, say thank you. Um, you mentioned that uh, it was strong storms, precipitation was up to 71% since 1958 in the Northeast. Um, I'm old enough to remember a series of very bad hurricanes that hit the Northeast, starting with Hurricane Carroll back in 53 or thereabouts. If you uh, had the data, you probably don't, but you went back to say 1900, a similar number of years, and you incorporate those three to four years of extreme weather that we had, but that changed. Yeah, so that, that since 1958, so the data actually goes back quite a bit farther. When we look at precipitation data, generally what we see across the country, this is also true for the Northeast, is that generally precipitation levels were variable but flat up until about 1960 or so. And then from there, they started tilting up. So it, that since 1958 is just since when we've seen this measurable change. It isn't the length of the record, yeah. How about the uh, time that the dam removal? Um, can you talk about about whether that was a controversial uh, issue at the time, and how long the process took from getting to the end to get the dam removed? Yeah, it was. So I'm I'm told it was, um, yeah. So so the question was, you know, thinking about the Whittington Pond dam removal. 
Um, you know, what was the process? Was it controversial? How long it took? Um, so there was a ramp up uh, as there was concern around that dam failing, other uh, flooding behind the dam. Uh, and that, as I understand it, uh, went on for at least several years, few years leading up to the project. So it was really just doing kind of an evaluation. Uh, and then as the dam was about to fail and, um, uh, and all that, then there was definitely concern about what do we do this? We need to reinforce this with you know, a heavier dam. You know, there was concern that you know, the whole downtown was gonna get flooded if it wasn't done properly. Uh, so it was, it was controversial, I think, in that um, it took just a lot of community outreach for people to understand what the process would involve and, and what would be there. And then there was, there was simply that people liked having the pond right off their backyard. And I think that's where they had the most pushback um, that lingered for the most amount of time. Um, when Bill Napolitano talks about this, he actually knows personally a few of the homeowners that were right along that pond that were really not happy that they were gonna lose their pond. Uh, and what they found actually is that they, because the pond had all these kind of problems as these ponds behind dams often do, uh, what they found is that they actually now enjoy having the river there more than having the pond. Uh, so they enjoy having this natural marsh area uh, and a river system. Uh, the fishing is better and, and there's, there's all kinds of benefits that they've noticed. So there, there was controversy in, in all of these different aspects. Uh, I think with good outreach, good communication, they were able to move through them. But the, the, the money was cheaper to remove it than... than it was. It, I don't know if that was the bottom line, uh, but it was certainly, it was one of those values that certainly resonated with the community, yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Do. 
and what happens on the ground in your community. So a lot of this comes down to how you implement. So we're here to help you with that, but really um, you're the important folks in the world when it comes to that. Okay, so I didn't bring water up, so I'm just gonna breathe for a second. Okay. Having said all that, panelists, thank you so much for coming. Your unique perspectives. Yeah. You're all working on the same stuff. <laughs> So um, we're going to have the, the panelists introduce themselves, and as I said, we have the unique perspectives. Each of them is representing either a um, regional um, agency or community. And as we talked about before, there's so many different things happening in so many different communities and different and different areas of focus that um, I think we're going to learn a lot. So, having said that, I'm starting the timer now because I've just taken 10 minutes of your time that doesn't count. So, um, I'm going to go in. I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is ask you a question. It's a two-part question, um, and ask you each to sort of give me a couple of minutes, two or three minutes, because we do have a specific amount of time um, to answer the question. So, um, if you could each give a brief introduction to who you are, who you represent. Um, and the role that you're playing in your community or in your um, organization in the implementation of the Great Marsh Plan. So we'll start with you, Brendan. Okay. I'm the town administrator here in the town of Essex. Thank you for coming today. We're happy that you could all share this wonderful place with us. Uh, in Essex, I wear many hats. Um, everything from uh, procurement to helping the selectmen with a variety of policies that need to be implemented. Uh, to just all kinds of things that you need to uh, consider when you're dealing with running a town. But I also have a, a background in coastal marine science, and so I have an interest in that, and what a perfect place to be a town administrator in because of the very things that we've been speaking See about today. To work. And so I've been involved in the last uh, several years in grants that can help, could first help to, to show everyone what the effects would be. Now we're moving more towards outreach, like some of the information you saw up here today, getting different uh, groups engaged uh, in the process and in the general public. And I think very importantly, we need to have an eye toward those first mitigation steps, those first projects that we're going to undertake in order to move the ball forward on the ground, beyond the studies, beyond getting, getting everyone's support, it's actually making change in the environment, whatever that means in a particular place. And we're looking forward to that in Essex, and we need to begin now, because a lot of it may take, as was mentioned earlier, working with uh, different organizations because of regulations or trying to get a pilot project off the ground, that type of thing. And that's kind of been my role, and I'm, I'm going to stick with that and keep working with all these great partners. Hi, my name is Peter Fippen. I'm the Coastal Coordinator for the Mass Bays National Estuary Program, Merrimack Valley Planning Commission. Um, and I wear many hats in the uh, Great Marsh uh, resiliency planning effort, not the least of which is implementing some of the, uh, the um, projects that Wayne or I guess Chris Hilke mentioned about um, restoration. But for the purposes of this panel, I am wearing my um, stormwater hat. And as Wayne alluded to in his talk, stormwater is a very important component of the, the uh, pollutants that enter into the Great Marsh and help to reduce the resiliency of the Great Marsh. Um, as a member of the North Shore Coalition, which is an um, organization of four entities, Ipswich River Watershed Association, Salem Sound Coast, Coast Watch, my organization, and the Merrimack River Watershed Council. Um, we work with um, a number of communities in the Upper North Shore um, on stormwater issues. Um, we deal with low impact development, um, outreach to communities, help them with their MS4 permits, on which is a stormwater permit. Um, and I'll talk more in detail about what um, the actual projects are that we're working on um, in a few minutes. Can you reach? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's plenty, oh, plenty of slack. Uh, I'm Alicia Galen. I'm the conservation agent for the town of Ipswich. Um, and uh, I, I wear pretty much just one hat, um, being the conservation agent. But um, in attending um, several CZM um, and Salem Sound Coast Watch uh, workshops on uh, impacts of climate change and sea level rise, I got really excited and applied for one of CZM's grants. And I got $63,300 for FY17. And that, I guess, gave me another hat. And what that project was, um, we were, um, we assessed a one mile stretch of the Ipswich River from the Ipswich Mills Dam to Town Wharf where erosion of Coastal Bank was threatening critical infrastructure such as roadways and utilities, including a main sewer line. Um, uh, and we also, we knew that significant portions of this reach of the Ipswich River is heavily armored with um, seawalls and revetments and that because of the impacts from climate change and sea level rise those areas that weren't armored were getting hit even harder. So uh, what we, we is in phase one of a planned multi-year project the goal of our grant was, hello, uh, was to um, determine what was causing the coastal bank erosion and identify possible nature-based solutions to address this erosion, create conceptual plans for nature-based stabilization solutions, including pros and cons for each technique, how much it would cost, and as part of how much it would cost, we were encouraged to consider uh, long-term operations and maintenance of those green infrastructure techniques. Uh, and we also threw in there um, to see if we could have um, public access for non-motorized boaters and anglers as part of one of our nature-based uh, stabilization techniques. We wanted to identify all of the uh, environmental permits um, needed to complete this work um, and then draft an environmental notification form or ENF under, the, uh, under MEPA, the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act. And then finally we had a public education and outreach component um, on the importance of protecting coastal banks. <laughs> So by the end of the project, there were six areas that we'd studied um, to find out why they were eroding and figure out what kind of nature-based solutions were possible. We took them to a 10% design sketch, and then we took um, two of those areas uh, from the 10% sketches to 30% conceptual designs, and I drafted an ENF uh, for that work. The public education and outreach component, which was, um, I should mention that Irwa was one of, was our partner um, with the town of Ipswich, and Kristen Grubbs did a fantastic job as our outreach coordinator. We had a website with regular blogs on the project. We, we created an educational brochure, I brought some, um, that we sent out to the public. Um, we had, uh, I participated in a K through 12 STEAM showcase at Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Math. And I have my little um, science fair type um, thing that I put together is over there for you to take a look at. Um, we had a public meeting. Um, we did a presentation, Chris and I, to high school students. And then we also put together, um, posted two educational signs on the importance of protecting um, coastal banks. Um, we put in for funding for this year, and we, we unfortunately didn't get it. But it was it was a, it was because we were too ambitious. We thought we could do 25 things in 12 months, and really, you need to focus on doing one thing well rather than maybe. I bit off more than I could chew. So we're really excited to to apply for. Um, for next year's round of, round of funding. And in the meantime, we're continuing our public education and outreach. We've got a water access subgroup through our water advisories committee where we're gonna continue looking at um, non-motorized boater access. And we're also pursuing internal funding for coastal bank stabilization where nature-based solutions were deemed not appropriate because when you've got only five feet of land between the river and your sewer line. Um, anyway, so um, if we'll have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I'm Martha Taylor, I'm the town planner from Newbury, and uh, I've been in this position since 2008. 
but I've actually been working on, on uh, planning for the town since 1999, really. I moved there in, in 1998, and um, 1999 uh, got involved in the Open Space Committee, and then after that uh, was elected to the planning board. And one of the thing that, things that really strikes me about all of this is how different the dialogue is now than it was then. <laughs> Um, you know, currently I'm on the, so the stormwater committee. I've, I've um, kind of headed up our team for the hazard mitigation plan update. Um, I'm on the master plan committee, the open space committee, which has been kind of dormant, and served on the municipal task force, force for this um, Great Marsh project. And the things that we're discussing today are things that we just did not discuss at all in our original open space plan or in the 2006 master plan. Um, the open space plan really focused on the town's recreation needs and the master plan focused on many of the sort of typical kinds of, of things that a master plan does, the normal elements. Um, and even our open space update that was done in 2009 um, didn't focus on any of these issues. In fact, um, it was kind of put on hold while our finance committee took a look at it to see what the negative financial impacts of the plan might be before it was actually uh, approved. So I see a lot of things today that were discussed. Um, Senator Connor Ives talking in the beginning about um, the land conservation um, issues and a lot of discussion today about incorporating these ideas into our master plan. We're in the process right now of updating our master plan and we'll be, uh, as part of that effort, looking at how we can incorporate the adaptation strategies into the plan, probably not as a separate uh, chapter, but we see it touching really all of the elements, natural resources, housing, economic development, transportation, everything basically. So we'll be looking at seeing what, what the interface is there. But we're certainly, we have a lot of vulnerabilities. We're in about 24 square miles. 30% uh, of our land mass is in the Great Marsh. 48% of it is in the floodplain. And as we go forward, looking at economic development and housing, we're participating right now with MVPC in a housing plan and trying to look at where we put housing, both with our existing constraints, wetlands constraints, Four soils were on septic systems everywhere except for on Plum Island. So, and, and now we're looking at, at uh, storm surge, marsh migration. So, how do we balance all of that um, in terms of identifying locations for housing and for economic development in general? Take a deep sigh after that. <laughs> Uh, I'm Donna Holliday, um, Mayor of the City of Newburyport, and I'm very happy to, to say that I um, was just on Tuesday re-elected to another four years. It was a, it was a tough campaign, and I'm, I'm very glad to be here with all of you. I can't even begin to describe the role that I feel as Mayor in terms of the responsibility of carrying a city as we learn more and more about storm surge, rising tides, climate change. Uh, we are very fortunate to have a group called Storm Surge who is doing an amazing job of educating the community, bringing in really high level scientists, people who are actively engaged in this work and you know, bringing a new level of education across uh, the greater Newburyport area. And uh, that, that absolutely is essential. I know there was a lot of talk about education. We also, I'm very proud of uh, some of our leaders who work in the city team, John Eric White, our city engineer, our assistant engineer, Diane Gagnon, and of course our conservation agent, uh, Julia Gofferson. And they were the team that led uh, the work in the Great Marsh study in the city of Newburyport. Uh, in addition to that, they have also been working in other areas. Certainly we have all, all hazards planned done by uh, Merrimack Valley Planning Commission. We brought in the Community Builders Group. It was the federal program with HUD and EPA and uh, uh, the Federal Transportation who came in and did an assessment. But 
we had the Meister group come in and work with us and do assessments. So we've had lots of pockets of assessments and we've also witnessed firsthand, you know, some of the tremendous challenges that we have on Plum Island in terms of what's happening there with erosion, with the loss of homes. Uh, we've uh, had a legislative delegation that went several years ago to Washington. We were uh, going to be granted a token, maybe 20 minute uh, meeting with the Army Corps of Engineers National Headquarters. After two hours, we walked out of there with a commitment for the $20 million to repair the jetties, which was wonderful that that happened. But with that came another whole set of, of issues and problems and changes in erosion patterns. So we're always, always struggling with that. Uh, another piece that was, I think, really important for me as mayor was I was invited to, uh, in southern New Hampshire and Hampton, just about two, a little over two years ago, uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists brought coast, invited coastal mayors from all over the country together for a weekend of brainstorming. And what was really interesting was to see that all of the East Coast mayors are dealing with the same issues with regulations, with policy, with funding. Some have been hit harder than others, like Mayor Zimmer and Hoboken in terms of, you know, that city during Sandy being breached on both sides. But learning from other uh, communities across the, uh, the coastline, and I think that's important also, is to share successes and stories. And so after that weekend of brainstorming, I went and established an ad hoc resiliency committee that has been working in terms of identifying you know, our vulnerabilities, which are huge in Newburyport. So what I really appreciate about the depth of the work of the Great March study is that it really clearly identifies where we are bringing all of these pockets of research together in one document. And I'm grateful that we also have the MVP grant um, so that, that we will begin working with uh, Melissa, actually, uh, as our leader, there you are, as we begin to put these, uh, to prioritize, because there's so many areas of concern and uh, looking for funding and how we begin to move these projects forward. So I'm, I think where we are as a city is to begin to identify those priorities and then begin to, you know, tick off where do we begin in terms of some of the greatest vulnerabilities. So it's a pleasure to be here and I look forward to our continued conversation. Thank you. Uh, so hi, I'm Ann Herbst. I'm a senior regional planner with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Uh, and in that role, I, I'm working with cities and towns to develop climate vulnerability plans. But I think I'm probably primarily here today for my former role as conservation administrator for the town of Hull. Um, for people who don't know Hull, it's, it's where Nantasket Beach is. It's a very densely developed uh, barrier, low-lying barrier beach. It has the third highest number of repetitive loss properties in the state uh, with a population of only 11,000. It's had more than $15 million in flood claims uh, since 1978. So naturally working there, we were very concerned about sea level rise and how that was going to dramatically uh, increase uh, damage to properties. Um, so in, in 2009, we adopted a free board incentive. Uh, we did that since we couldn't supersede the building code. Uh, so the town provides a $500 rebate on building permit fees uh, for anyone who elevates their property two feet higher than, than they have to due to, to FEMA requirements. Um, you might imagine the selectmen were a little nervous when I brought that to them. One of their concerns was I couldn't point to anybody who had done it before, so none of you will have that problem. Now you can point to Hall. Um, <laughs> I think they were persuaded that it, it wouldn't be terribly costly. In our case, Hull participates in the community rating system program of FEMA, and, and we, they saw it as a benefit as, as part of participation in that program. Um, it's been a success. It's in, uh, since 2009, roughly 85% of properties elevate at least two feet. Most actually elevate three feet or sometimes higher. Once people go three feet, they start thinking about elevating a full floor to park underneath. Um, it, even though $500 is really a pittance in terms of support compared to the flood insurance savings, but it does somehow seem to have been really important to people that the town was providing this incentive and kind of putting their, their stamp on it. Um, I do think it's, it tends to be, it was very important to have a, a town champion in the permitting process to really, uh, some might say browbeat people to take advantage of it. Um, 
So uh, since, we, since Hull adopted the incentive, they've actually adopted two additional bylaws. One thing we found was that if you have an existing house and you're already at the zoning height limit, you, you couldn't elevate. So the town uh, now has a special permit process where you can request to, to elevate uh, beyond the zoning height limit. Uh, we also added a, a bylaw that for people who are elevating and need to do a small bump out into setbacks in order to elevate utilities, that they can do that. Um, uh, and since then also the town of Hull has adopted a zoning overlay district where they anticipate further development that has pretty hefty incentives to keep the whole first floor uh, elevated and, and basically flow through uh, and, and also put um, language that requires uh, consideration of future sea level rise into the site plan review regulations. So really nobody's doing anything. <laughs> okay, so we're going to get to audience questions, I promise. I just want to ask um, one more question of the group um, individually. Does that work? Okay, and I'll do it from over here. Um, so, and you know, Peter and Brendan, you might want to talk a little bit about the projects that you guys are working on now, but in addition to that, if you could each touch on something that you think, you know, where, where should we go from here? And, and, you know, what do you, what do your communities need to do to start to get traction in implementing these uh, recommendations that are in the plan? So maybe we'll start with Brenda and you can sort of bring us up to speed with where you're at and then talk about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're uh, working on our second uh, Office of Coastal Zone Management, Coastal Resiliency Grant. In the past, we worked with some folks here in this room, uh, Ipswich River, uh, with National Wildlife Federation, um, in conjunction with the Sandy Project as well, to really, as I said before, understand what the effects are going to be in Essex, and then move toward getting the word out and getting people beyond those of us that are in this field or are more familiar with it uh, to understand what the issue is going to be. So this, this year, we're working with the uh, National Wildlife Federation, Melissa, specifically, on a grant that will do several things, but one of the interesting things is going to try to couple up the field of resiliency, coastal resiliency planning, with the field of emergency management. And we've heard today how it's important to get the public interested in what we're doing in a certain way. And it occurred to us that most people, uh, general residents and general public, uh, are much more familiar with disaster planning and emergency planning than they are with the types of things that we're talking about today. So on Cape Ann, which now includes uh, Ipswich, uh, joined on to this group known as the Cape Ann Emergency Planning Team, uh, which has been running in our area for almost 10 years now. This is people from all of the communities, plus a lot of partner organizations, including hospitals, and Red Cross, and a variety of different uh, uh, groups, uh, to look at an all-hazards approach to emergency management. And that includes public health, which was something that was mentioned here today. Uh, that group has been instrumental in doing various drills and tabletop exercises in getting out into the community. And so we figure, since there's so many commonalities between the effects of what, what we're studying now and how that is played out in the emergency management field, it would be perfect to try to use that to pull more people into the conversation. Um, as you know, um, it's, it's often difficult to get what we're dealing with and what we're learning about and get that out to the community because in the end, when a particular project is going to be implemented, if you don't have the support of the residents, particularly if there's money involved or a local match, even on a, even on a grant basis, they're not going to understand what you're asking for or why it's important. And so, again, one element of this grant is to, is to really try to um, have some public workshops with the face of emergency management on them. But then that also helps our emergency managers understand what some of the future and more frequent drivers of emergency episodes will be. So that's where we, we stand right now. We're also working with the MVP pro program. We're going to be working with uh, National Wildlife on that as well. Hazard mitigation planning. 
uh, we're re rewriting our plan. All of these things are going to have uh, tremendous public input uh, components. And so we hope we can continue to utilize the, the, these uh, different venues to keep bringing the public in, keep showing them that this is now something that they need to internalize like many other fields that they're, that they're exposed to, like emergency planning. Uh, like I said in the beginning, when I talked before, so that when it is time to implement, um, you have the support you need, and you can go from there. Is that <coughs> okay? Thank you. So stormwater is a uh, non-climate change stressor, uh, but it is significantly important in that we the, the marsh itself, a healthy marsh, is, as you heard earlier today, the best line of defense, the best buffer against storm surge and sea level rise. Um, so that's what we want to do is try to protect and enhance the resiliency of the Great Marsh. Um, as I said, there's a, there's a North Shore uh, Greenscapes Coalition, which has a number of member communities within the watersheds of the Great Marsh. Four of the six communities in the community uh, resiliency planning effort are members of the North Shore Greenscapes Coalition. And each year, we work with the communities to do um, education and outreach to help them meet that component of their MS4 stormwater permit. Um, for instance, this year, we're working with them on the notice of intent. It's a brand new permit um, that's, that's coming out, more or less, um, that they need to uh, identify what they're going to be doing over the next five years of the permit. So we're working with them to uh, let them uh, understand uh, what they're going to be doing as far as education and outreach on stormwater, not only to the general public, but to businesses and construction activities and commercial enterprises within their community as far as stormwater goes. We also have a Keeping Water Clean program, which is in the school system uh, pro focused on um, fifth graders, uh, talking about everything from uh, groundwater and water supply to stormwater and wastewater to educate them on how the, the hydrologic cycle works and stormwater is a part of that. Um, we do public presentations, uh, keeping water clean, I mean, uh, uh, Greenscapes 101, why stormwater matters, um, slow the flow are all presentations that we give at various venues throughout the communities and throughout the region. Um, we also have a website, greenscapes.org, that you can go to and look at all kinds of uh, important and interesting tips um, and other um, outreach, uh, things such as public service announcements, um, rack cards on pet waste management, um, uh, what is MS4, what is stormwater for the general public, uh, things of that nature, as well as uh, you know, we've, we've done a lot of work with uh, communities and uh, private homeowners on uh, reducing stormwater on their, on their own properties, disconnecting uh, roofs from, from uh, sidewalks, infiltrating the water, um, landscaping practices that uh, use organic fertilizers or no fertilizers, infiltrating the water as best you can, uh, rain gardens, uh, rain barrels, um, all that type of stuff to help reduce the, the stormwater component that um, goes into the marsh and degrades it. So there's a lot of different things, a lot of different resources out there on stormwater. So uh, go to greenscapes.org and you'll learn a lot on how to deal with that. Thank you. Um, so where I have a, a bit of a myopic view of what goes on in Ipswich, since I do have my primary hat as being the conservation agent, um, I, I hesitate to say too much what Ipswich should do, but uh, what I see is, is that I think we should con continue um, doing what we have been doing in terms of partnering with um, other towns in the, uh, in the Great Marsh area, partnering with um, regional people like Peter and state agencies. Um, I'd love to see the town of Ipswich join the NVP. I think that it, with all the work that's already been done, I think it would be very little effort for very large benefit. Um, I, I think that we're going to be getting a new town manager. Our town manager is retiring. Uh, she's done an awesome job. 
Uh, and I'm wondering if the next town manager, there might be an opportunity to say, uh, for the town to say, we think coastal resiliency and coastal adaptation needs to be a primary goal of this position. Because we really need a leader. Um, we're all, as, as staff people, we're in our silos, as most towns are. I think we need to break those silos apart and start working together. And I think we need one person in Ipswich who says to all the different directors, I know you're all busy. Um, and this is important. I need you to come to this meeting, as, as, as somebody was saying earlier, and, and gets people into the room and gets them talking so that we can all coordinate and we can all move forward um, to protect our citizens, protect our amazing, beautiful environment that we have in Ipswich. Um, and so for those of you in the room that live in Ipswich, talk to your selectmen. <laughs> Well, I'm happy to say that um, we've already started implementing some of the best practices from the adaptation plan um, under the leadership of John O'Connell and Yvonne Boswell and our highway director, James Surratt. We've taken great strides on dealing with stormwater, um, stormwater issues. They've been very active in setting up our IDDE program. Um, and we've also been... Um, Several years ago, we revised our subdivision rules and regulations to require LID development. Um, uh, hard structures can be used if uh, LID isn't possible, but we're really encouraging all of our developers to, to go that route. Um, we're moving forward now. We, we are one of the communities in the MVP program, and so we're, we're really looking forward to building on the work that was done through the Great Marsh Project to look at areas that, that were just outside the scope of that project. We've got a lot of hazards in town which are not, you know, not related directly to coastal issues, storm surge, but we've got riverine flooding and, um, you know, possibilities for fire and a lot of other, other hazards which were identified in our hazard mitigation plan. So we're looking forward to really building on that and doing the community outreach that goes with, with that program. Um, also in concert with that, we are setting up a, a um, municipal vulnerability or hazard mitigation team, which is basically going to be comprised of the same people who are on our hazard mitigation team for the hazard mitigation plan update. And it's an interdepartmental team, which I think is tremendously crucial um, for moving forward with this. It's being headed up by our police chief, who's our emergency management director, and includes our conservation agent, myself, um, fire chief, um, and health agent, uh, highway director, building commissioner, and a couple of other people who have been uh, instrumental in our uh, stormwater management team and uh, Kristen. Um, so I think with that we should be able to kind of get out of our silos and really be able to talk, um, work together to identify those specific projects that were uh, called out in the adaptation plan to figure out which ones we can move forward with. Some of them are concrete projects with, which probably need funding but they're relatively doable. Some of them are longer term projects and really have to do with policy. Um, you know, we've got, we have roads that flood now under regular high tides, and they will certainly be impacted more and more as um, we see the level rise in climate change. Um, what do we do with those roads? Do we try to elevate them, or do we just say we give up on those communities, um, those neighborhoods that, that are accessed by those roads, Plum Island being? You know, that, that's a major issue with Plum Island and the Plum Island Turnpike. But there are others in town as well. There are some that are not necessarily critical for access to neighborhoods, but we have very few roads in Newbury that go east-west, and so they, they, they provide part of our east-west connector, and they flood on a regular basis, and it's only going to get worse. But going back to some of the discussion we had earlier about regulatory um, requirements and kind of the tension between state regulations and what we may need to do as communities to, to solve some of these issues. Um, you know, if we elevate a roadway um, that's impacting the marsh, do we then need to mitigate that someplace else? How do we do that? So right now I see many more questions than answers. And I think as a planner, and also a registered architect. Um, you know, we're used to looking at, at land use planning and as architectures dealing with the built environment to enhance people's lives. 
Um, but now we're in a situation where we really have to look at the dialogue. Um, it, it, it's, I don't want to say that it's not optimistic anymore, but we also have to react to some real stressors and hazards that are coming our way, so we can't, we can't turn a blind eye to those anymore. I think there's a lot of common themes that you're hearing from across the members of the panel. Um, I think regional work is really, really important, bringing communities together to, and I think we've seen the success of the Merrimack River Beach Alliance that's been in existence for eight or nine years under the direction of Senator Tarr. Um, we've made some, you know, real positive steps forward in addressing some of the issues on Plum Island, but you know, Plum Island will continue to challenge us forever. Uh, if there's any question about it, it's just, you know, barrier uh, island and, you know, we've got the water and sewer infrastructure there, we've got erosion patterns that continually change, and so we just have to continue working together with Salisbury, Newbury, and Newburyport, and to do the best we can in terms of uh, addressing the issues there. Um, I know it's not going to be a popular thing to say, but I think we should move an all future building out there or I come to a point where we set a, a goal of when, you know, it's almost built out at this point, but there's a point where you have to stop uh, because there, you're just putting more and more structures at risk uh, out there. Uh, we have to do more work in terms of access to and from Plum Island. That was part of the Great Marsh study too, to ensure that people can get on and off the island safely. This winter of 2015 was, you know, I'll never forget as long as I live. And, and there was one night I thought I was going to be stuck in a whiteout on Plum Island because of a snowstorm. And I made my DPS director get me home. But, uh, but you know, it's, it shows you what the real challenges are when you're dealing with, you know, real uh, natural disasters that are happening. So we've got that group that's really addressing uh, Plum Island, we're working together about the possibility of uh, a dredge project in the Squatta River uh, that could help us with dune nourishment, and then we will be on that into the individual other areas of our city, which are really at risk. Uh, I wish we had known what we know today, is we're just finishing a $34 million uh, upgrade to our wastewater treatment plant that sits on the Merrimack River. If we had known what we were doing, you know, 12 years ago when this was in the initial design, I'm sure the design would be different now. We have to figure out how to protect the infrastructure that we just spent a fortune on. Um, we have another major development by New England Development that's happening on waterfront, on our waterfront. And, you know, we're pushing with them in terms of their zoning to ensure that the buildings are elevated and then you've got issues with height and, you know, as, as I think you were mentioning, um, in Hall. So these are policy issues, they're zoning issues that we have to continue working on. We have to identify the greatest vulnerabilities, but we also need help from the state and federal level. These projects are expensive, and, you know, as it is, we're, you know, our support from the state in terms of our, our local aid and other funding has not reached previous high levels that we've seen in 205, 206, 207. Uh, we need help in terms of being able to get the kinds of grant programs. And, you know, $20,000 doesn't go very far, especially when you're trying to deal with some major infrastructure project. So um, I was talking to the, you know, Kate from Senator Markey's office and hoping that the Water Resource Act can, can make some treadway in, uh, in Congress. And, you know, I know that CZM and uh, our current administration has been putting more grants out to our community than we've seen in a long time. And so I know I'm very grateful as a mayor of a very vulnerable city for that, those opportunities. But also I think the other thing that you've heard here is education. Education is really important because unfortunately there are still are people out there who, uh, even though we've uh, filled this room compared to where we were six years ago, I think there's still people out there who aren't convinced. Um, and especially with the uh, uh, lack of leadership in Washington on this issue, that we have to still keep up the dialogue and education, educating people. Um, we are holding on December 7th. Do we, Sheila, do we have a super venue yet? It is at City Hall. I wasn't sure if we were moving it. December 7th at City Hall, uh, our work with Storm Surge in the city in terms of all, all, all hazards.
hazards work. We're coming together to you know, share what we've done so far in terms of uh, the work of storm surge, what the city's been doing. Uh, I'm sure part of the work on this uh, Great Marsh Grant will become part of that. So uh, I just encourage us all to keep being champions in our communities, keep coming together in these types of settings to share uh, successes, struggles, and we've got an sort of awful lot of work ahead of us, but it's very refreshing to see the kind of energy here that is uh, moving moving these uh, important initiatives forward. So thank you. Um, so I'll share just a few thoughts on, on implementation. Um, the town of Holligan uh, completed their first vulnerability assessment plan a year ago, and I'm actually now back working with Hull with my MAPC hat on because they are updating their, their five-year hazard mitigation plan. And they and uh, the largest focus of that plan is, is now integrating the climate vulnerability assessment and the recommendations. Uh, and they just held their first public meeting, which if people have ever done those, they're usually not well attended and uh, pretty dry, uh, but in their case they uh, put it on local TV and they held a meeting with the Capital Outlay Committee, which I thought on their part was a really smart way to emphasize that really there is nothing they can do anymore without considering sea level rise. So I, I think they're well on their way to some good implementation. Um, I'm also working with three NAPC communities that are just now completing their climate uh, plans and they you know, they have many actions that are related to their geography and to their demographics. Um, but I thought I would highlight just a few that are, are more process oriented um, because I do think they are about making sure the plan doesn't sit on the shelf. So one recommendation is that they maintain a standing committee of department heads that will regularly meet to, to assess progress and to assess change. Uh, another is to incorporate, uh, again, all the recommendations into their other planning documents and into their capital outlay work. And then finally, as, as everyone else has emphasized, to, to, to continue to do public outreach and education. And I think others have also mentioned that they've seen progress over time, and I, I have to say that the last hazard mitigation meeting I did in the hall felt like I was able to see progress over about eight or nine years. My, my first presentation on climate before the Board of Selectmen, I was in Hall, I was uh, interrupted by a selectman who told me he didn't believe in climate change. Um, sort of derailed my first presentation on the topic. Uh, and then, you know, this time that there was uh, no question that, uh, that we needed to deal with sea level rise, simply questions about how it was going to be done. So, progress happens. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think what we're going to do now is sort of turn it over to you all for questions for the panel or comments that maybe you'd like some feedback from the panel or a panel um, sort of weigh in on. So if there's anyone who has anything, I'm going to, what I'm going to do, well actually I'm not going to do that because Julia's going to carry the microphone around. I was going to um, repeat the question. If you do need me to do that, let me know. I'll, but I'll, I think with the microphone we may not need to do that, so we'll see how that goes. So, Hi, can you uh, tell us uh, how, to what extent MassDOT has uh, played a role in, in your planning efforts? Um, in Essex, right out at the, at the street, you'll notice that if you've been through here in the past few years, we've done a whole downtown streetscape replacement it was a full depth reconstruction of the state highway with sidewalks and uh, better throughput for vehicles and pedestrians uh, bicycles and that's an interesting question because during that project a lot of people thought that the roadway was going to be elevated because of these types of things back then it wasn't really being discussed a lot but in essex re regionally but in Essex, it was a very hot topic of conversation because the, uh, that roadway, mainly during storms, does go underwater and it had for quite some time. I bring it up only because the state would have worked with us to do even more than they did. We got a few inches of elevation in the roadway. Um, but oftentimes, the challenge is if they do something in one place, like raise the roadway here in Essex, what happens to the parking lots of the local businesses, ramps that would have to go down there, um, uh, even, even property rights, how can the state extend 
its reach onto private property and to help them to help people access the businesses. And so we haven't had any other direct dealings with DOT, but it is a related topic, and I guess I bring it up because there's so many things that could be done in a vacuum that, that are in practice very difficult to do for other reasons. So um, I'm relatively new to Ipswich. I've only been there not quite four years, but I do know that um, Mass Highway did a water quality improvement project on um, um, near, I'm, I'm near EBSCO um, on County Road and I know that they did some improvements to Route 1A north of town and they, they redid the road in an area that is prone to, chronically prone to inland flooding um, but that was not taken, uh, they didn't have the funding um, to, to address the flooding issue. Um, I do know that um, the road out to Great Neck and Little Neck, which routinely floods, um, the, the town is working with um, the federal government to, to raise that road, but I know that because of the issues that Brendan was mentioning, you can only go up so high before you make it impossible for people to get to their houses. Um, so uh, I think there's a, a, lot, a lot of opportunity, again, to be partnering um, to, to make things happen. I think the uh, only thing that I can say about MassDOT being involved in this subject is that they um, have that um, bridge, small bridge and dam program, and um, is it the Stormwall or is it CZM who's doing that, that piece in terms of, you, you're doing the one in terms of the storm, seawalls I mean. So I think MassDOT is helping communities in terms of uh, dams and bridges that they own or waiting. We have a bridge that goes between Newburyport and um, West Newbury that we're very concerned on the Lower Springs Road and we're waiting to help to see if we get some grant funding for that. So I think that's where you know they've been helpful with small grant programs but I think that there's more work they can do. I think that they've implemented Complete Streets which is terrific in terms of taking that federal model and providing us with funding for that but I think that there's more policy work that has to be integrated into their work that they do on um, state roads and and some of the roads that come through our communities that are state roads that have to be uh, integrating more in terms of uh, you know stormwater and some other issues that are uh, important to this topic. So MEPC has a, a group they call which is the 14 communities surrounding Boston that, that works on climate issues and uh, this is more in a general communication sense that uh, the, somebody from MassDOT attends and, and is sort of the person looking at climate adaptation. So it's to facilitate uh, communication at this point. This is kind of a little bit of amusing, but we've been involved in the Sandy Grant model and I think Highways is involved in producing a model that's relevant to some of the coastal byways. And modeling is becoming kind of very important in how we project. We're talking about resiliency, we understand erosion, we understand wave runup. One of my concerns, and I don't know if it's relevant, and it's a question, should we maybe look at a different way of going about things? But a lot of our outfalls, all our BMPs are very low, in our town anyway, probably in Raleigh, somewhat Nipswich, in, in, in concept to a high tide, let alone a long duration storm where the Gulf of Maine fills up for a very long time. So what I'm thinking is how can we actually calculate the duration of a long term storm with an 11 foot tide and 10 inches of rain on the upland because that's going to produce your rivering, flooding and, and water can't go anywhere. And I didn't know if there was a way at going forward to maybe take some of these models that are out there and fund them to make us understand that. So. <laughs> we Great agree. idea. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, in, in some places they, they pump the water into the ocean where it's low. They, they close it off and pump it in, but I'm not sure that's a very good solution, but um, it's just a design flaw in how we designed our our streets and our infrastructure um, that we just don't, the water doesn't have any place to go when it starts building up and it's only going to get worse as sea level rises and storm surge increases 
and as Daniel mentioned, as the storms become greater, more rainfall coming down. I just had a quick comment for Ann, although you may be familiar with this, but the situation in Hull will greatly improve after the Piscata quite dredging. You're going to get about half the till of, uh, Catherine, correct me, 350,000 cubic yards. Is that meant going to Hull? That's possible. Yeah. So that will improve the situation. But as climate change accelerates or progresses, I see a time when emergency and long-term stewardship sort of conflate or come together more and more frequently. What does a group like this, or what are you doing when those two things intersect? How do you, how do you deal with the emergency in the context of these long-term beautiful strategic plans? I think that's a, an excellent question. I think there's been some conversation about how you have to bring uh, your emergency services together uh, when you're, you know, with your whole team when you're dealing with this. And this is something that we, I think, have done fairly successfully in uh, Newburyport. Um, unfortunately, you're always reacting to a situation that does occur. And I think the best example that I can give you is, is during what we call Snowmageddon, which was 2015, 10 feet of snow, six weeks, and then we lost the, uh, it was a proprietary air vac system uh, down Northern Boulevard uh, in, on Plum Island, and we had to evacuate, you know, I don't know, 100 plus uh, people to area hotels because it took three and a half weeks because you have to work in sequence to pull these valve pits that were frozen solid uh, to, to get the vacuum pressure back working, moving in sequence. So we come together with a team of people with the Coast Guard, with public, you know, uh, uh, our emergency management, police, fire, uh, council on aging, our schools, all of, we do this every time before a storm and then our natural disaster uh, and we do it after to debrief in terms of what did we do well, what didn't we do well. And we found that that has been incredibly helpful uh, in terms of preparation. And you know, sometimes, you know, Mother Nature, there's things you just can, no matter how hard you try, you can't prepare for. But it also teaches us things in terms of communication, which becomes a real important piece to communities when, and m members of your community when you're in the middle of a crisis to be sure that they're getting the right information out. So looking at what kinds of systems are we using um, in that piece and also, um, I don't think we're at the, a moment of crisis looking at long term, but we know after the fact during debriefing that we know that we are dealing with this is what we're going to see more and more of as we go forward and what other resources and supports do we need to successfully manage these kinds of, of crises that occur in our community. And I think we're fortunate to have, you know, MEMA, um, you know, and the work that outreach to, we had people from Pennsylvania, New York, um, Maryland, uh, we had crews from all over the Northeast coming in to help uh, our communities and I think that that's also something that we have to really shore up and ensure that we have the kinds of resources we need when things like this hit. I just wanted to say one thing. I think when, when we go into this project that I described earlier, one thing that we can use to help illustrate how those things come together is that parts of climate change and sea level rise, more, climates, more so climate change right now, are an emergency right now. When one of these storms rolls through and you say, I've never seen anything like that, there's a reason for that. And that's because climate change is starting to increase the severity and the frequency of these things. So I think we can try to use aspects of what we're talking about, which is going to be a lot worse in the future, to show people that it's already kind of nipping at our heels and illustrate that and what that looks like. I, I think it's, it's already clear, but I did just want to note the critical importance of involving emergency management early in the process. And uh, I saw that in Hall where it was really the first presentation I gave, gave was solely to the emergency uh, management person and, and the town manager. And uh, I don't know if you were hinting at this or not, but there can be conflicts between emergency management and protection of natural resources. So having 
good communication and understanding has made a big difference when there were conflicts about protecting the dune and needing access over the dune, those kinds of issues. So I think it's, it's just another argument that everybody really needs to be at the table and, and understanding the issues because there are going to be challenges when you're at cross purposes potentially. Good point. Um, what is uh, your greatest funding challenges? Uh, or what is the hardest thing to get funded? Somebody has to <laughs> Funding for implementation because it's so expensive. Um, you know, you can see we've done the planning, we've done a lot of planning, we've done outreach, we've done a lot of um, setup, but, and it's not that there isn't implementation funding out there, but there's just not enough money to do a lot of implementation, and that's where we're at now. That's what we need to be doing. I would agree. Um, when we talk about implementation, we talk about um, natural solutions and trying to do restorations of areas that might help us when a storm surge comes in. Those things are going to be very, very expensive. In essence, we're working right now with the Army Corps of Engineers. Fortunately, they came in and they're willing to do an overall view of some ideas that we have. And it's a feasibility study. And hopefully, if we can find some different strategies that align with uh, what they would back, what um, state regulations, within state regulations and, and such, we can turn to more federal money because um, even if the project seems like it's a very simple one, you're operating out in an environment that has very challenging logistics and always those types of projects are gonna bring a, a big price tag. And that's gonna be a challenge, but we're starting to look forward to it. And we're starting, I see it, uh, communities wanting to break into that and start getting a piece of that, that federal money uh, for, for mitigation, restoration, all of these things, even if it's not going to come from the top as climate change money, we can probably use things that will help us in that way anyway, um, because that's where, where the large dollars are. I just wanted to add one thing to that because I think one of the things that has been incredibly frustrating for me to watch is that we have to wait for some kind of major disaster that impacts our communities and takes out a sewer system and then all of a sudden we get $610,000 from FEMA to alarm the system so we could have prevented this from happening. I mean we know this story, we know it with you know, other hurricanes and the impact that it's had on other, other communities across our country where if the government had only, if they had only, if they had only put money towards, you know, the design of the levees in New Orleans that were previously, you know, identified, then it wouldn't have had the impact that they're still feeling today. And so that, I think, is one of the most frustrating things is why are we not being more proactive as a state and the federal government rather than being reactive and depleting all of these emergency funds and giving them to communities after the fact. Uh, I think if we could shift the focus to being more proactive and be able to do, uh, I think one of the most successful programs in Massachusetts has been the Mass Works Grant Program. And this is where they took a bunch of small Mass um, Department of Transportation grants roll them all into one grant program where you can get you know, several million dollars and do something really significant. It's been a very, very successful grant program across the Commonwealth, but it's tied to infrastructure pro uh, projects that have economic development. Now, could we have a program that has uh, um, infrastructure projects tied to climate change? Wouldn't that be wonderful? <coughs> Hi, I'm from Newburyport. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for the information you've been giving us. I have really two questions. Um, one is, I know that in Newburyport, we successfully worked with the high school in having the students that came and presented earlier. And having the, the students involved in our presentations, like the climate cafes, more people attend. And I also think education gives students more um, encouragement about their own future 
you know, maybe it gives them some tools. My second um, thing is, I don't think that there's enough public education around hazards, like a big snowstorm. Um, there's more and more of these furnaces that are vented out the side of your house, rather than up the chimney. And if that gets covered up, um, you're in trouble. You know, so maybe there's a sheet you put out in case of a huge snowstorm. These are the things you need to check. Um, so that's that. In terms of resources and partnering, I noticed the trustees is not here. And it, in a presentation in Ipswich uh, last month, uh, the work that the trustees of the reservations has done to look at their long-term, I'm standing corrected. <laughs> <laughs> not what you thought all enough. But they, uh, the Jeff's question, the Woods Hole group put forth a dynamic evaluation system for modeling that allows you to make a lot of assumptions and see what the variables are. So there's something on the horizon that would seem to be pretty important for the next phase. Yeah, um, the trustees, are, we, have, uh, we have some representatives here in the back of the room. Wave your hand. Um, <laughs> um, they're, they're doing a fantastic job. They're being forward-looking. They're leaders. Uh, I was privileged to get to hear um, their presentation as well, uh, and, and and that's a, a, another opportunity to partner with them. They're they're finding some funding to get this this research done, and they can share that information, and we can all work together and, and move things forward. Since I have the mic, I'm gonna step up. I just quickly, I, I am with the trustees. I have my colleagues Russ Hopping and Jeff with our ecology program. I'm the director of stewardship. And we have Dave Santameno with our land acquisition team, so we are actually heavily interested in this issue. We own 15% of the Great Marsh, 3,000 acres. And uh, for us, one of the things that we're wondering is, as communities, how do you see not only our landscapes, but other landowners uh, playing a role in some of these nature-based solutions, and what are your priorities at working with landowners to begin to put this into practice? Just real quick, with, in, in Ipswich, one of the things that we were doing, trying to do with our grant um, it was was to, um, to 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 try something out to say we're going to assess this and and, and use it as um, as a case study a pilot a pilot project um, so to speak so that we could show that nature based solutions do work in these kinds of inf uh, this kind of situations and then be able to share that information with landowners with other towns and so that the um, we can we can start getting those technologies implemented. Um, Wayne showed a, a slide um, of potential areas to protect and I think that that's very important for the land trust within the, the Great Marsh area is to prioritize the areas for marsh migration or for uh, areas that are adjacent to the marsh and protect those. But certainly marsh migration is, a, is going to be a, a key factor. Although it's not large, it's still a component that, that should not be overlooked. I think uh, if we're going to look at natural solutions in the future and you're looking at the, the marsh system as a whole, absolutely uh, some of those things are going to need to be implemented over a very wide area and you can't just discontinue it if you don't have buy-in from all the property owners that are going to be affected in that area uh, because A, the solution will not be effective if you have holes in it and B, um, aesthetically if you're trying to accomplish something across a broad area, you, you're going to need to carry it out equally so that um, eventually things that have to grow back and things that, that, that have to um, come about after you do the work are consistent and even. So property, uh, prop discussion among prop property owners, I believe, will be extremely important. Time for one more question. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm very disturbed by, I don't know if there's anything being done to review the water permits and so forth. But I just remember, especially last summer, the Ipswich River was dry. Friends of mine were along the river, their wells were going dry. Yet you go to Beverly and water is running down the gutters, the sprinklers are going, the fountains are going. 
because they have rights to the water before the people on the Ipswich River do. Now, is there any uh, limit to uh, these permits or review process or anything else that uh, could uh, be a little more equitable? It's a, it's a huge issue. It's one of those old time rights issue, water rights. We think we have it bad here in the east. Go out west, it's completely different. These things are grandfathered, and the only solution in that regard is the state legislator. We have a law that grandfathers these water rights. Trying to get towns to do it willingly is, is really difficult. Trying to get people who feel water use as a right is really difficult. But over time, we'll, we'll get there. Things, things are improving. The upper watershed is improving in Redding. Um, but it's, it's just going to take people like you, Ted, and, and all of us banding together. Um, to go through the old school political process of both at the, the town level to use the water and at the state level to change the existing grandfathered laws. But um, we, we can get there, it's just, it's just a long haul. To thank our panelists again for, for um, you know, being with us today, staying for the entire day and really like sharing with us your real world experience. I know that there's a whole lot of people in this room with some real world experience. So I'm looking forward to um, being able to move forward and, um, and work with you all. We as a group are looking forward to doing that. Um, so I'm going to say one more time, thank you to our panel.